Okay, uh, so welcome to our last lecture of the semester. We've studied a lot of topics, uh, and today we're going to conclude uh, with virtual memory, and then we'll have an epilogue session where we will talk about some future directions, uh, etc. So hopefully it'll be exciting. I mean, virtual memory is an exciting topic by itself, as I mentioned in the last lecture. This is a concept that has been around since the 1960s, and it, it, it's, it, re it really needs a serious rethinking, as we will see in some of the issues, and as I will recommend you to potentially study if you're interested in this. Uh, but it is pervasive, it's everywhere. It's one of the very successful ideas, but I still believe that it, 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 we need to really think critically about virtual memory today so that we can scale it uh, much better, or at least, scale, at least scale the advantages it provides uh, to us much better in a different way, potentially, for, for our future systems. Okay, so let's jump in. I'm going to uh, go through this relatively quickly. You know that you have some readings that would help. And recall, uh, in the last lecture, we introduced the downsides of direct physical addressing from uh, load and store instructions. And I'm not going to discuss that again, uh, but uh, virtual memory gets rid of a lot of those downsides of direct physical addressing, uh, which leads to uh, basically direct physical addressing has uh, issues with relocation, uh, isolation, protection, as well as programmer being involved in managing memory. But uh, the idea of virtual memory is to give the, each program the illusion of a large address space while having a small physical memory so that programmer doesn't worry about many, many things, managing the physical memory, managing different processes, uh, and programmer basically safely assumes that they have an infinite amount of physical memory and uh, they're happy, hopefully. Uh, and uh, as we discussed, hardware and software cooperatively enable this. And we, were, we started looking into the hardware and software support for virtual memory. And the illusion is maintained for each independent process. And this was one of the pictures that I used to uh, uh, give you the idea. Basically, you have multiple different virtual address spaces belonging to different processes. It could be within the process also, potentially. Uh, but we didn't talk about that. And we're not going to talk about that really in this lecture. Uh, and you map it to physical address space that is of limited size or much smaller size. And this requires indirection and mapping, as we discussed. And we introduced the idea of a page table which does both the indirection as well as the mapping by doing address translation from virtual addresses generated by CPUs load and store instructions to physical addresses that are required to access physical memory. And you can see that uh, page table is uh, the mechanism that enables address translation. It's a lookup table, essentially. It's OS managed lookup table, but hardware has access to it through the memory accesses and hardware caches it as we will see. And a page table tells you whether the virtual page you are accessing is in physical memory or not. And if not, it helps you, at least uh, the system, the virtual memory system helps uh, uh, bring the page from the disk into the physical memory. As a result, physical memory is a cache for the disk. And we've studied caches for the past few lectures. So you know how the cache is managed. And we're gonna look at that a little bit more within the context of uh, uh, physical memory uh, uh, today as well. Okay, and recall we were discussing four issues in injection mapping. Uh, we discussed actually a bunch of these. When to map a virtual address to a physical address. Usually it's demand-based, but you could do prefetching, which is another idea which we had discussed as well. What is the mapping granularity? We're going to talk a little bit more about that today. It's essentially page size today, but then the question becomes, what is your page size? Is it four kilobytes, 16 kilobytes, 64 kilobytes, one megabyte? Do you want multiple granularities? In existing systems, there are multiple granularities as well because there are clear trade-offs. If you have a very small page size, then you may not be, uh, you, may, you need very large page tables and you may not get very good locality also when you bring things into the physical memory. If you have a very large page size, your page table size becomes smaller clearly because you need to store fewer pages in the page table. Uh, and you may get very good locality when you transfer a large page into your, uh, physical memory if you have very good spatial locality. But if you don't have very good spatial locality, you may be transferring a one gigabyte page into your physical memory and using only eight bytes of it. As a result, it doesn't work very well. So there are clear trade-offs between uh, large pages and small pages and different granularity pages, just like we discussed with large blocks and small blocks in caches. That's why physical memory looks very much like a cache to disk. Uh, and it is actually 
uh, when we talk about virtual memory. We talked about where and how to store the virtual to physical mappings. That's page table, essentially. But we're going to cache it in the hardware today. Uh, what to do when the physical address space is full? Essentially, uh, we need to evict some page that we cached in the physical memory. And how do we decide that it becomes problematic because we're dealing with a very huge physical memory address space, especially today. Right? So we're going to talk about some of these issues in a bit more detail today. But recall this another slide that we use, physical memory as a cache. It's a cache for pages stored in disk. So as a result, similar, all types of caching issues that we discussed in the caching lectures uh, exist here as well, plus prefetching. Uh, basically, any kind of management mechanism, placement, replacement, granularity of management, right policy, uh, instructions versus data, all of those actually arise uh, here as well. OK, some definitions just to uh, get you on the same page again. Uh, no pun intended with the page over here, but essentially page size is the mapping granularity, but as we discussed. It also dictates the amount of data transferred from hard disk to DRAM at once. You could optimize that. You could sub-page things, just like we did sub-blocking, if you remember, uh, in, uh, in caches, right? Uh, but you need to be very careful about this because now things are exposed to software, which is the operating system. Page table, I've already said that multiple times. It's a lookup table that's used to translate virtual page addresses to physical frame addresses. And address translation is that process, essentially, that translation process. And this was one picture that, we, that I showed you. Ideally, you would get most of the CPU addresses, accesses hit in physical memory, uh, but some accesses miss in physical memory. So you will need to bring the data from the hard disk. And hopefully, you get the best of both worlds, the latency of physical memory and the large capacity of the hard drive. OK, and this is a picture of address translation. I'm going to show you a more generic picture later. But this, this is the example that we were doing uh, when we finished uh, the lecture. We finished the uh, lecture with it, uh, finishing with these examples, if you remember. And you can follow this example uh, from the last lecture or, the, or your book as well. Book has, actually has this example. And this was the example. I'm not going to go over it again. But clearly, uh, this uh, shows you how to do the address translation. You index the page table with the virtual page number. How do you find out the virtual page number? You make sure you chop off the page offset, just like you do in a cache access uh, where you chop off the byte and block. And then a page table, now you can also calculate the size of the page table. It, has, it needs to have two to the 19 entries, as you can see over here, because you have 19 bit virtual page numbers. And in this case, you index it. Uh, uh, the, basically, the processor needs to do a memory access to a page table entry located at offset two from the page table base register, which is in physical memory, essentially, which is a, which is a pointer to the page table in physical memory, essentially. And in this case, it happens to be that that location uh, says the page table entry is valid, which means that the, trans the physical uh, page uh, corresponding to uh, the virtual page you're accessing is in, disk, is, in, is in memory, is in physical memory. And this is its physical frame address. And you basically take that and concatenate it with the page offset. That leads to the physical address that we're accessing. And remember, page offset bits do not change during translation. And uh, hopefully, you remember all of this. OK, recall that we were discussing the issue of page table size. This is where we almost left off, actually. We wanted to calculate the size of a page table. And I increased the size similar to today's sizes today. A virtual address today could be easily 64 bits. Uh, and that's a huge address. And if your page is 4 kilobytes, then your virtual page number is 52 bits. Basically, if your physical address is 40 bits, that's 2 to the 40, which is a reasonable, uh, respectable physical memory size today. Uh, and uh, then your uh, page table needs to do a translation of, from 52-bit virtual page numbers to 28-bit physical frame numbers, which means that it needs to have 2 to the 52 entries. And assuming each page table entry is 4 bytes, this is 2 to the 54 bytes. Now, this is larger than your physical memory, right? And your page table needs to be stored in physical memory. So we have a problem here. We need to access physical memory. We have to go through the page table. Page ta to, do the, to be able to do the translation through the page table, page table needs to be stored in memory, but we do not enough if in physical memory, but we do not have enough physical memory to store the page table. So clearly, this is not going to work. Right? And this is just for one process. As I said, each process has its own page table. And the process may not be using the entire virtual memory space. So uh, even though it, it has a 2 to the 64 bit uh, to, uh, access to 2 to the 64 addresses, it may be using a very small fraction of it. But uh, the way we describe the page table, you still need to store every translation for every virtual page number. So this is essentially uh, doesn't, doesn't work in existing systems. Basically, the page table is large. And at least part of it needs to be located in physical memory. You can say, OK, maybe I can 
locate, uh, I can put parts of the page table in virtual memory also. But you need to do, be careful about that because you, you should not be, you should be able to translate the page table as well, right? Uh, but at least part of it needs to be located in physical memory so that you can actually find out where the other parts of the page table are in virtual memory and then bring them from the disk, okay? So it's large uh, and uh, if, if it cannot be fully accommodated inside the physical memory. So what do we do? Basically, people have developed the idea of multi-level or hierarchical page tables where you have, uh, you organize the page table in a hierarchical manner such that only a small first level page table has to be in physical memory. And all of the other page tables can be in virtual memory. And you need to you go through the translation process to bring the page table into the physical memory before you can actually do the translation of the address that the processor generates, right? Now it's multi-level translation, as you can see, and it's, uh, it's fun to think about, but th this is the idea of multi-level or hierarchical page tables. And this is again from your book, Basically, it looks like this. Instead of having, instead of dividing the virtual page number into a single monolithic piece and indexing a single monolithic page table with that, we divide the virtual page number into two pieces, uh, which lead to a two thing, two level hierarchy, a two level hierarchy. The topmost nine bits, in this case, provide us the page table number. And this is the first level page table, essentially. This has to be in physical memory. And then after we get the translation of that address, of that part of the address, this is, provides a pointer to the page table base registers of other page tables. So if you look at the first level page table, it's 2 to the 9, 512 entries. And each of them points to a page table that contains 2 to the 10 or 1K entries. Essentially, this is a hierarchy of page tables uh, you have right now. The real page table is actually here, second level page table. But to be able to access their second level page table, you need to go through another level of, let's say, indirection or another level in the indirection so that you can actually get the page table entry you're looking for that corresponds to the full virtual page number. So basic idea is very simple, as you can see. Divide, instead of having a single virtual page number in, indexing a monolithic page table, have chopped the virtual page, tum, uh, virtual page number into multiple pieces and first index a small page table that has to be in physical memory. And then using the uh, base, base register over, over, uh, that is uh, provided by uh, the page table over here, index another page table to really get the translation that you're lo looking for. So this is fun, as you can see. And as I said, only the first double page table has to be in physical memory, which can be very accommodatable, as you can see over here now. It's only two to the nine, 512 entries. And each, if each entry is four bytes, then it's only two uh, kilobytes, right? Very small. Okay. Uh, and only the needed second level page tables can be kept in physical memory. For example, if the process is not using the entire address space over here, this is a 32-bit address, uh, by the way, it's from your book. It, it may be actually a 31-bit address, I don't remember. It's a 31-bit address, actually. It's the same, it's the same uh, example that we're following. Uh, basically, if any of the other uh, parts of the virtual memory is not used by the process, you don't even need to have a page table for that, basically. If some part of the virtual memory is not allocated by the process, you don't need to have page tables for it. This way, you can really compact the storage of the page table significantly. And this is just two levels. You can also extend the idea to multiple levels. But what is the downside? The downside is now each translation requires additional latency, right? You can see that you first need to translate this page table number to get the page table base register. And then you, you need to do the real translation uh, by getting the real physical page number corresponding to the uh, entire uh, 19 bits over here. So it's a two level access. So you need to do two memory accesses to get the translation and then one memory access to actually do the memory access you're supposed to do, right? So clearly this increases the latency. So another level of indirection always increases latency. So we added one level of indirection, monolithic page table, now we're adding another level of injection, two level page table. You can add another level by making it a three level. Clearly uh, that way you can reduce the storage that you have to have in physical memory for a given process. And also you can basically ensure that a large uh, amount of the page tables are not allocated if the process is not using the entire virtual memory or if it's using a small fraction of the memory, but the trade-off is between the latency and this capacity, uh, memory capacity trade-off. This is a very fundamental trade-off. Latency and capacity always goes against, go against each other, as we have seen between uh, uh, in, in caches, right? You want to build some big memory, uh, but big memories are slow. 
And this is very similar in a sense. You, we're making it smaller so that we can make it faster. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Basically, this is an example of the translation. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but this is our 31 bit address. How, how do you uh, actually get the translation for it? You basically take the top nine bits and access the page table, the first level page table, which brings us, which gives us the page table base register for uh, the second level page table. In this case, it's valid. So it's uh, the second level page table that we're looking for is inside physical memory. So we can uh, take that address, add to it uh, the page table offset to get the translation that we're really looking for. And that's our physical page number. You concatenate it with the page offset. Now, if this translation was not valid, meaning the page table base uh, we are looking for was not in physical memory, then we need to actually bring the page table that we're looking for into the physical memory first, which is also handled by the virtual memory system. So virtual memory system manages the page tables, not, not only the translation, but also bringing in the page tables from memory as well. Okay, so as I said, for an N-level page table, we need N page table accesses to find the PTE. So a latency increases. And a page table access is a memory access, essentially, right? as we have discussed in the last lecture. So this is a real example from an x86 architecture. This is a, uh, this is a two level translation, as you can see, as we have seen earlier. Uh, basically, your linear address is divided into three pieces. Offset is the page offset. Uh, for four kilobyte pages, it's 12 uh, bits, as we discussed. And they basically divide it into page directory. They call this part the page directory. It's a directory of page tables, essentially. And the second level page table is accessed based on the page directory entry plus the offset. Uh, from the address over here coming here uh, from the table. And you can see that in x86, CR3 is the control register three that points to the physical uh, page table base register for, for uh, they call it actually page directory base register uh, over here. And this, this is a part of the process. So whenever you context switch in a process, the CR3 needs to be pro uh, uh, put into the processor. Uh, so it's part of your hardware context as we also discussed in the last uh, lecture. Basically, CR3 is a special name in x86 architecture uses for the PTBR, page table base register, as we know it uh, from our lectures. But as you can see, this is real. It's going to get a little bit more complicated. So in this case, it's page directory base register because multi-level, uh, as we said, right? Uh, okay, does the file system map pass to virtual memory? Uh, and the answer is actually yes, file system, uh, whenever you load a file, you also do it, uh, map it into physical memory. And uh, you, you go through the virtual memory to access the file. And we will see an example of this later on, but not in great detail. You will see more examples of this in systems programming uh, course when you will see. But uh, modern file, and you can also read uh, the, uh, the uh, unassigned parts of your book, which talks about memory mapped IO, for example, memory mapped files. So files get, whenever you access a file, they get memory mapped through the virtual memory system. And you do loads and stores uh, into the file uh, later on. So very good question. Uh, we will see how that is exploited in Rovehammer in a little bit, uh, but not yet. OK, so this is for small pages. Uh, this is exa exactly the same picture, actually, uh, shown in a different way. Uh, you can see that this is the virtual address. x86 calls it linear address. This is for 32-bit addresses. x86 now has 64-bit addresses, as we will see later on also. But you can see how they do it, basically. Page directory is very small. It's 2 to the 10 entries. And CR3 gets concatenated with the directory entry over here so that you can access uh, the physical address over here. And then you get the uh, address of the page table you're looking for. You, off, you find your PTE uh, from an offset uh, coming from these bits. And then uh, you basically uh, form your physical address as we have discussed. Right? So it's basically, as we have discussed, it's multi-level. This is a large page in x86. It's a four megabyte page. Uh, it, it also has multiple pages, as I said. Whenever you allocate a page, you can decide what uh, size of a page you use, actually. And you can see that this four megabytes, it doesn't require a two level address translation because if your pages are large, your page directory is small to begin with basically. So you just go through a, what they call a page directory. But, but I think you, they should have called a page table, but uh, to be consistent with uh, what is shown over here, they call it the directory, but this is really the direct page table for four megabyte pages, as you can see. Right? And it's a very small page table because your pages are very large. Okay. And this is the x86-64 addressing. Uh, this is uh, actually there are 64-bit addresses, but the top 16 bits are not used because there are no, uh, at least people have not uh, perhaps found use for 2 to the 64 bytes uh, 
virtual memory. So the, the largest virtual memory you can get is two to the 48 bytes, which is 256 terabytes. But of course, I'm thinking in the future, they will need to extend it also. But they're dealing with 48 bytes, uh, 48 bit addresses. And you can see that now there are four levels. This is the first level, nine bits. And this has to be in physical memory. And then you index into another level. They say they called PML4. I don't remember what it st stands for, but PLM4 extended over here, actually. And then page directory pointer extended. That's what e, e means over here, or and maybe entry, actually. These are entries, sorry. Uh, and then page directory entry, and then page table entry. So this is you do a four-level page table lookup just to get to the page table entry that you're really looking for. And then you do the translation over here. OK, so clearly, this is a lot of accesses. And this is real. This is what happens in your x86 processors if you're using x86. OK, but we solved the problem, basically. Page table is large. We made it multi-level uh, so that only a small fraction, very small fraction, has to be in physical memory. So we don't waste physical memory address space. This also, this hierarchical page table also enables us with the ability to not allocate page tables in virtual memory. So we save, uh, we save the allocation of page tables uh, uh, if the process is not using uh, a lot of virtual memory space, basically. OK, exactly how it's done. That's beyond the uh, per, uh, subject of this course. So you can, uh, you, can, you can read more or take the systems programming. And I don't know how much detail uh, uh, the systems programming goes into in terms of virtual memory subsystem and how it interacts with the file subsystem as well. OK, so uh, the, the second challenge, of course, which is exacerbated by the first solution for the first challenge is each instruction fetch or load store requires at least two memory accesses now. One for address translation, you need to reach the patch table. I should say at least one for address translation because with a multi-level page table, you need more. And then one to access the data with the physical address after translation. So you used to have one memory address with, uh, with direct physical addressing. Now we have two at least. So you need to have two memory access to service an instruction fetch or load store and that greatly degrades execution time. Each, each memory access takes, I don't know, if it misses in the caches and it takes 100 uh, nanoseconds, then you're in trouble. And you're in bigger trouble if you have a multi-level page table because the number of memory access increases with the number of levels in a multi-level page table. Unless you're, of course, clever, right? Unless you have a mechanism to speed up the translation and we're going to be clever, we're not going to tolerate, uh, we're not going to basically tolerate this latency uh, overhead of indirection that is very costly and we're going to speed it up. And to speed it up, we're going to use a, is an old trick uh, in our bags, right? And that's the idea of caching again. So these translations, they could be, they could have very good locality because whenever we access uh, a, a particular location in virtual memory, it's likely that we're going to access location again or locations around it again. So we can get good, good, both good temporal locality and spatial locality just because of the way uh, things are done, just because, uh, just because of the way programs are written as we discussed in caching, right? So the same locality applies here as well to the translations. So why not cache the page table entries in a hardware structure in the processor to speed up the address translation? That's the idea of a translation look aside buffer. It's essentially a cache for page table entries that you can access with one, within one cycle or just a few cycles, such that you can get your addresses translated right away without going through the page table. And this is called the translation look aside buffer. Again, this is. We're not caching the data, we're caching the translations. But since we're going to access the data, if the data has locality, translations should have locality as well, right? Because these are coupled with each other. Because, and we have seen that data has locality, physical, uh, spatial, and temporal locality. It's, no, it's going to be no different in this case. So it's really a small cache of recently used translations or PTEs, page table entries. In fact, in each TLB entry, you have a page table entry. And the idea is to reduce. Uh, the number of memory accesses required for most instruction fetches and loads, loads and stores to only one. Well, not even one actually, because the translation look aside buffer cannot be considered memory. It's really a cache. Uh, so basically you reduce it to a cache access. You get the translation right away without even accessing memory. But of course, the, for the first time, you need to bring the translation to the memory, into, into the cache and store it there, into the translation look aside buffer and store it there. Okay. So why does this work? As I said, page table accesses have a lot of temporal locality just because data accesses have a lot of temporal locality as well as spatial locality. Uh, it should be temporal and spatial locality over here. Actually, I should edit it over here. Okay, that sounds uh, good, hopefully. 
uh, and we can discuss that later on also. But large page sizes, eight spatial locality, actually, a lot. Uh, if you have a gigabyte page size, and if you're actually traversing a gigabyte array, and your translation granularity is gigabytes, then you just need one single entry, right, in your TLB, as well as the page table. And consecutive instructions and loads and stores are likely to access the same page, as we have discussed many times. So TLB works ju just because other caches work, and TLB is a cache of page table entries. And it's small, usually accessed in the order of one cycle or three cycles, somewhere on that. Typically, its size is small at level one. It's actually 512 entries is quite large for level one. And typically, just like any other cache hierarchy, you can have a TLB hierarchy as well. Later on, we will see an example of this. Usually, it's highly associative. Usually, you get very good hit rates, but depends on the workloads. If you're doing random accesses, of course, then you have a problem, right? If you're randomly going through memory, then you don't have locality anyway, and TLBs exploit locality. Uh, it reduces the number of memory access for most instruction fetches and loads and stores to only one. And if you hit in the TLB, actually, you don't need to access memory. And this is an example two-entry TLB from your book. Basically, it's like a cache. This is a two-entry cache, uh, two-way sensor associative, meaning fully associative. And you can see that uh, it's very simple. But what do you do? Basically, you, you index it using the virtual page number. Uh, and essentially, in this case, it's also tagged. There's no index because it's fully associative. The virtual page number is your tag also in the entry. Uh, and each entry, the, the stores, the data of each entry is the physical page number. Uh, actually, it's really the PTE, uh, page table entry uh, over here that's stored. Uh, but uh, for, for simplicity purposes, this shows uh, only the physical page number. But basically, you search the TLB using the virtual page number. And if you find a valid translation, valid PTE corresponding to that virtual page number cached in the TLB, you can do the address translation very quickly. And that's what we show over here. So hopefully this is a simple idea after you know about caches, right? And as I said, TLB is a translation or PTE cache. It caches PTEs, page table entries. And all issues we discussed in caching and prefetching lectures apply to TLBs. For example, usually TLBs are split between instruction and data because they're needed in different parts of the pipeline. And we discussed the advantages and disadvantages of instruction and data caches. Same things apply to TLBs. We have multi-level TLBs, we have associativity, choices in terms of size, trade-offs in terms of block size, et cetera, all of them apply. Insertion, promotion, replacement policies. Again, you want to keep in the TLB uh, most useful translations that are going to be needed in the future. And all of that apply. What to keep in which TLB and how to decide that, prefetching into the TLBs. Keeping TLBs coherent. We talked about cache coherence a little bit. That also applies. Uh, shared versus private TLBs across different cores and threads, that also applies. So everything related to caching that we discussed applies to TLBs because they're also caches, except they cache translations, they don't cache data. Okay, so let's go into a little bit more detail into virtual memory support and examples. Uh, I'm going to go through some of these quickly because some of them are actually redundant slides that, uh, based on what we have discussed, uh, but feel free to ask questions. So as we discussed, virtual memory requires both hardware and software support. If you do it in just software, if you don't have TLBs, your performance is terrible. So it's a bad idea if you don't have hardware support. You should really have hardware support for virtual memory. And at the very basics, you need to have support for translation, meaning accessing the page table. But TLBs is a no-brainer if you have virtual memory. Right? So page tables in memory, it can be cached in special hardware structures called TLBs, as we discussed, right? So the hardware components of the virtual memory is usually called the MMU, or memory management unit. And this is usually a per core unit. Every core has a TLB, for example, L1 TLB and L, uh, L1 data TLB and instruction TLB. But also, it includes other things. It includes page table base registers, TLBs, page walkers. We will discuss that. So uh, some, uh, some systems do the page walk automatically, meaning in hardware. Uh, in hardware, you, you may actually do the multi-level page table walk, and that require, that may you may use specialized hardware for that. And we will discuss that from a real example from Intel systems at the end of this first lecture. So it is the job of the software to leverage the MMU to populate the page tables, decide what to replace in physical memory, but it could also be the job of the hardware in contract with the software. And the software definitely has to change the table, page table base register on a context switch so that you can use the running threads page table. And software needs to handle page faults and ensure correct mapping, as we will see in a little bit. So address translation, we've already discussed this. Uh, basically, page size specified by the ISA. Old times, the page sizes were smaller. Now, page sizes are bigger. 
And there is a push for having multiple page sizes, small and large pages. Clear there are trade-offs here. I've discussed that in multiple lectures, so I'm not going to discuss it right now. And we've already said that, uh, defined all of these terms. So let's take a look at what's in a PT, what's in a page table entry, because it's going to be interesting. We saw some things, but let's take a look at it more. So a page table is a tag store for the physical memory data store. It's a mapping table between virtual memory and physical memory. And page table entry can be thought of as a tag store entry for a virtual page in memory. So you need a valid bit. You need to indicate validity of or presence of this virtual page in physical memory. You need tag bits, physical frame number or physical page number to support translation, of course. You need bits to support replacement. Uh, what data gets, uh, what page gets replaced from physical memory if the physical memory is full and you need to bring in another page from the disk. You need to have a dirty bit to support write back caching because in physical memory, when you write to a physical memory location and that location, that page needs to get evicted, what do you do with that updated data? Uh, usually we have a write back physical memory, meaning uh, you don't expose all of the writes that you do to physical memory to the disk, right? That is uh, unreasonable because it's too slow. So you need to have support for uh, writing back. You need protection bits to enable access control and protection. And this is going to be important in our later discussion because virtual memory provides support for memory protection as well, not just address translation. So this is my cartoonish picture that basically shows all of these. And I'm not going to go through this cartoonish picture, but we're going to examine it. But I guess one thing that is uh, shown over here is the R bit, reference bit, access bit. Was the page reference recent? This is one way of doing uh, uh, replacement or helping replacement. You basically have a single reference bit or access bit also called in some operating systems. You basically say uh, whether this page was recently referenced. And if, if the R bit is set or A bit is set, access bit in uh, x86, it's called an A bit actually. Uh, basically, if the R bit or reference bit is set, this means that the page has been referenced recently. So don't evict it or try not to evict it from physical memory. That's the idea basically. So a single bit can help you replace things in a nicer way. And because, and you have actually a lot of time in replacement, in page replacement. Okay, address translation we've seen before. I'm not going to go through this again, but this is a generic address translation picture. You can study it on your own. And uh, we already discussed uh, the page table structure. Again, this is generic. We discussed a hard-coded page table structure, but this is more generic with N, M, P, as you can see over here. And we already discussed address translation and page table entry, what it provides. I'm not going to talk about that. But let's take a look at what the MMU does when you get a page hit, meaning address translation hit. So, uh, I mean, this, these are actually obvious steps. So I'm going to go through this quickly, but we are going to uh, build up to the page faults in a little bit. So this is the easy case. Processor sends a virtual address to the MMU, including the TLBs. MMU fetches the PTE from page table in memory or provides it from the TLB. And if you get a hit, you uh, basically MMU sends the physical address to the L1 cache and L1 cache sends the data word to the processor. This is assuming that L1 cache is physically addressed. We will take a look at that later on in this lecture without going into a lot of detail. Okay, so this is an easy case. What if you have a page fault, meaning the, uh, the page that you're trying to access is not in memory? So again, it starts with MMU fetching the PTE from the page table in memory. It finds out that the valid bit is zero. So MMU triggers a page fault exception that software needs to handle. It could also be handled by the hardware, uh, but software usually handles page faults in modern systems. Handler now identifies the victim page uh, and uh, meaning which page. So basically you need to bring another page from the disk uh, to memory, assuming that the physical memory is full. If the physical memory is not full, then you basically uh, bring a page from the disk into an invalid, into an invalid frame in physical memory, obviously just like in caches, right? If it's full, the page fault handler identifies a victim page and it basically replaces it with the new page coming from the disk. Of course, if the victim page is dirty, it needs to be written back to the disk, right? And then the page fault handler pages in the new page and updates the PTE in memory, it changes the translation basically. And it changes the translation for the evicted uh, physical frame as well. So think about how to do that. This becomes difficult. How do you figure out the evicted? How do you figure out the page table entry for an evicted physical frame? Page table provides mappings from virtual to physical. But now you're trying to invalidate a mapping using the physical frame number, physical address. How do you index the page table? You cannot because page tables uh, index using the virtual page number, right? So a lot of operating systems actually sometimes uh, use some inverted page tables also. Uh, or some hashing mechanism to actually figure out uh, the, the backward mapping from physical frame to virtual page as well. So there are a lot of details over here that are actually, that, that make the system extremely complicated. And that's one of the reasons why virtual memory 
is, uh, is amazing in the sense that it's been extremely successful, even though it has added a lot of complexity into the system. So supporting virtual memory in the old system actually was not easy because it was very costly. Okay, and then the handler returns to the original process, restarting the faulting instruction, because now you have the data that you need inside physical memory, so you can restart the access and access the physical memory. Okay, so page fault handling actually is a lot more, uh, and I'm going to give you an overview uh, as, uh, without going into a whole lot of detail, but I've given you one example complexity that is introduced when you evict something from physical memory, right? Okay, uh, I, I mean, we've, we've discussed this already. Uh, you, ex uh, you incur a page fault exception when you access a, a page table entry that doesn't have the valid bit set, and you inc invoke an OS interrupt or trapped handler, exception handler, actually. Other processes can continue executing, but this process needs to stop. An OS has full control over the placement. So before fault, you actually access something on the disk, and that needs to be brought into the physical memory, as you can see over here. So basically, uh, in this case, uh, the mappings of other stuff remains unchanged, but you actually have another mapping that's introduced. Now, one page is not in disk anymore. It's in physical memory. Okay, so let's take a look at it a little bit more detail from the system perspective. So processor, to service the page fault, processor needs to signal the I.O. controller so that the I.O. controller reads a block length of P start, page size starting at some disk address and store uh, uh, starting at memory address Y. So I basically need to do a disk to memory transfer and this needs to be orchestrated by the operating system, which also needs to know exactly where in disk the page you're looking for is. So there's another data structure that, require, that has that information. It could potentially be stored in your page table, assuming it fits into your page table, uh, but we're not going to go into that. Assume that it's a separate data structure for now. Uh, so disk to memory read occurs after that through some direct memory access transfer without hopefully disturbing the processor. It happens under the control of this IO controller over here. And then when the controller finishes the transfer, it interrupts the processor saying that I finished the page fault request that you asked me to service. And the operating system resumes the suspended process after of course, fixing the page table entries, et cetera, right? Okay, so there's a lot that goes on to service a page fault and that's what you need to know for this course. Okay, so page table replacement algorithms, uh, clearly this is similar to page replacement algorithms but a little bit different in the sense that physical memory is huge. So if physical memory is full, meaning list of free physical pages is empty, which you need to also keep somewhere if you think about it. So there's a lot more complexity I'm adding right now, but you can think about how to do that. Which physical frame do you, do, should you replace on a page fault? Okay, so is true LRU feasible? We have four gigabyte memory, four kilobyte pages, how many possibilities of ordering? So true LRU is not even feasible in a 32 way associative cache. Now it's actually huge, right? So it doesn't make sense. And true LRU is not necessarily a good idea anyway, right? Because uh, as we discussed, access patterns are not always LRU friendly. So modern systems usually use approximations of LRU just like we do in caching, except, uh, 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 except in physical memory, we have a huge physical memory. So this is really a rough approximation of LRU. So the clock algorithm is one example we will discuss briefly. And there are more sophisticated algorithms that can take frequency of use into account. Actually, you can afford some of these more sophisticated algorithms because it takes long to service a page fault, right? You need to do a disk access. And while you're doing uh, the, the page fault handling of the page that you need, you may decide, okay, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to take some time to pick which, one, which, which page in my physical memory to replace because you have a lot of time. So you can actually afford some sophisticated algorithms over here. And that's the difference from uh, caches uh, here. So the ARC algorithm is actually one of the famous ones. Uh, I would recommend you take a look at it if you're interested. It takes into account the frequency of use. Uh, it's developed by IBM uh, and it's used, by, used in some of their operating systems. Actually, newer versions of it is used in some of their operating systems. And you can take a look at this paper if you're interested. Okay, let's talk about the clock page replacement algorithm. This is a, this is a very simple page replacement algorithm that was used in early systems, early Linux, for example. Now it's used, it's more sophisticated. But basically it looks like this. For each page in uh, physical memory, you have a reference bit. And basically you have the hand of a clock and you start going clockwise, trying to find a page whose reference bit is set to zero. And once you find a page whose reference bit is set to zero, you say, okay, this is my victim. I'm gonna replace that. You basically skip through all pages that are whose reference bits are one. And that's the idea basically. And these bits are periodically cleared. 
They're set when you access the page, when you need the translation, basically, when you need the page. They're cleared periodically by the operating system. So this turns out to be a relatively cheap algorithm to implement in terms of both, heart, both cost, both storage overhead and latency. And usually you find uh, something to replace. And usually it works reasonably well, basically. So I've given you the idea, but let's go through it relatively quickly also. I keep a circular list of physical frames in memory, operating system does. So the operating system does all of this, basically. Keep a pointer or hand to the last examined frame in the list. When a page is accessed, you set the reference bit in the PTE. Remember, I showed you those. When a frame needs to be replaced, replace the first frame that has the reference bit not set, zero. Traversing the circular is starting from the pointer hand clockwise. OK, very simple algorithm. During traversal, one option could be to clear the orbits of examined frames. In this particular case, that's, that's what I wrote here. But you can also periodically clear it. You can do it during traversal, which reduces the overhead of periodic clearing. Basically, there are different methods for clearing. it, And then you set the hand pointer to the next frame in the list. OK? So this is very simple. This tries to figure out which one has not been referenced frequent, uh, recently, right? which page has not been referenced recently. OK, so a cache versus page replacement. Physical memory is a cache for disk, as we discussed. It's managed by the system software via the virtual memory subsystem. Page replacement, as a result, is similar to cache replacement. You can, you can actually imagine implementing clock type algorithms in a set associated cache also. And it works not so badly. Page table is the tag store for physical memory data store, as we discussed. So the difference is the required speed of access to cache versus physical memory. Cache needs to be fast, usually. Physical memory is slow. In fact, whenever you get an eviction, it's even slower. So you have more freedom in your algorithms and page replacement. Number of blocks in a cache is smaller than number of blocks in physical memory. So you have some more overhead, tag overhead in uh, physical memory. So you cannot really afford extremely sophisticated algorithms that require a lot of storage. And the tolerable amount of time to find a replacement candidate is different. Disk latency is much higher than memory access latency. So the caches are at a disadvantage here, whereas physical memory is at an advantage and the role of hardware versus software. So in general, in our discussions of hardware caches, we said they're hardware managed, right? We, can, we don't usually manage the caches through software. We, the replacement is done, placement is done, insertion is done, promotion is done, all of it is done by the hardware. But in physical memory, software has a role in management and replacement is one of the big roles in software. Setting the access bits is the job of the hardware, usually the reference bits, but the replacement itself is the job of the software. So, Virtual memory is a nice concept where responsibilities are divided in a nice manner between the hardware and the software, but complexity is not avoided. Basically, complexity is still there. OK, so now let's talk about memory protection, uh, which is another thing that uh, virtual memory provides. Basically, as we discussed, uh, um, I don't see any questions, so I, I, I will keep going, essentially. Uh, so virtual memory uh, provides address translation and indirection and mapping, which is a lot of benefits. And one of the benefits that this enables, especially page-based virtual memory, is memory protection. As, as we discussed, multiple programs are concurrently. Each process has its own page table. Each process can use its entire virtual address space without worrying about wh where other programs are. And a process can only access physical pages mapped in its page table. It cannot overwrite memory of other, another process. So this provides protection isolation between processes. That's the beauty of page table-based isolation. And it enables access control mechanisms on a per page basis. So it can actually set these uh, protection uh, bits and isolation uh, guarantees on a per page basis, on a page granularity. And you can do sharing and access control on a per page granularity. Right? So let's take a look at this over here. So each process has its own virtual address space. You, each virtual address, uh, each process sees a full address space. And this simplifies many things as we have discussed in the past. I'm not going to discuss it again. But each process can have access to its own pages, but they can also share the pages, as you can see over here. So different processes, different virtual addresses can be mapped to the same physical page. This could be read-only library code, right? You don't want to necessarily replicate. It could be some shared data between the processes that can be allocated using system uh, calls also. Uh, but for example, you can, you can say that this virtual page that I'm accessing cannot be accessed by anyone by setting the page table entry uh, uh, access uh, to, to the level uh, that you want for this process. And we will see examples of this. Uh, so there's one question. Is there also something like prefetching for optimizing page accesses? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just like caches, you can prefetch into, you can prefetch translations into the memory hierarchy as well. Okay, so page level access control. So not every process is allowed to access every page. 
and that uh, is uh, supported by virtual memory. So you need supervisor or modern name is kernel level privilege to access system pages, for example. You may not be able to execute instructions on some pages. People have, uh, actually more recently, recently in the grand scheme of things, non-executable pages were in, uh, introduced so that you cannot just write some uh, data to some location and jump to it and then execute some malicious code, for example. So the idea is to store access control information on a page basis in the processes page table. And I've already said this. And uh, during hardware translation, you enforce access control at the same time. So concurrently with translation, you check whether you have access to this page. So virtual memory system as a result serves two functions today. They're independent of each other. Address translation provides the illusion of large physical memory plus other benefits as we discussed. Access control protection essentially protects different processes. And even within the same process, you protect different pages so that you don't do something malicious to some pages that are important potentially. And this is my cartoonish picture basically that shows exactly the same thing if you're interested. Translation and access control. So if anybody asks you the two things that virtual memory provides, two functions virtual memory provides today, that's it. Translation and access control. OK, so this is an example. Again, we extend the page table entries with permission bits. And permission bits uh, can say whether you're allowed to read the page, write the page, execute the page. So you can imagine different things over, over here. And then you check the bits on each access during a page fault or uh, even a TLB access, right? It doesn't have to be during a page fault. But if violated, you generate an exception. And this is called an access protection exception. And when you get an access protection exception, the operating system gets involved. And it basically usually kicks you out of the system uh, or stops the process, basically, because the process is not supposed to access that location. Because it happened because for some reason, right? OK, so that's how you enforce. Basically, during the translation, while you're doing the translation, in the TLBs, you enforce this also. OK, let's take a look at these protection uh, uh, levels in x86. x86 doesn't necessarily have the best protection architecture, but I'll show example from x86. Uh, basically, you have different levels of protection called protection rings. Kernel is at level 0. Applications are usually at level 3. And if I have to actually uh, look at these, usually you make use of ring 0 and ring 3. Supervisor is the same thing as kernel in modern terminology. And the rest is users, if you will. And if you look at the page directory entry and PTE of an x86 uh, manual, it basically shows you something like this. So it's like a page table entry. So you, you can see that PDE for four megabyte page, PDE for the page table, not present PDE. So they show you different things, basically. If not present, you ignore the rest of the things. Uh, but uh, let's take a look at this. This is the PDE. You can see that this is the valid bit. This is whether you can read or write to it. This is whether you need to have user level, uh, supervisor level access to it. And an access bit this is the same as reference bit. And then address of the page table. Same thing happens uh, for page table entry. This is the second level uh, page table entry. This address of the four kilobyte page frame, as you can see, and the same protection bits also exist over here. But the format is different because this is the second level. OK, just to show you that, basically. And then there's, of course, description in the instruction set architecture that says what uh, these bits mean. OK? And this is the PDE. PDE protects all 1,024 pages in a page table. This is the first level page table. And then PTE protects one page at a time. So you have multiple levels of protection also when you have multiple level page tables. So that's another benefit of multi-level page tables. You can get multiple granularity protection to some limited extent. And you can see, uh, I'm not going to go through all of this clearly. You can see if you're interested, uh, these things. And then there are fun combinations of it, basically. The protection is a function of PDE plus PT in the end. And then you have some combined effects that is also described in the manual. And yeah, now you, you're starting to see how complicated things can get, right? When you have multi-level page tables, plus access control, and plus different types of access control. And I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you can read it. But let's, let's uh, talk about something that ties the lecture we're having to something we talked about at the beginning of the class, which is Rohammer, right? And hopefully, I'm going to give you uh, 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 an understanding of how Rohammer violates uh, the virtual memory protection mechanism that we just saw, basically. What, basically, virtual memory protection says, you just if, if, you, if you're a user, you cannot access a supervised level page. If your uh, access type is uh, right, and if you're reading a read-only, if you're write, trying to write to a read-only page, you should not be able to do that, right? And that works, right? That should work, basically. But unless someone can flip your bits, unless your hardware is unreliable and someone can flip the access protection bits, right, such that a user level program can gain supervisor level access. And that's what happens with Rohammer, for example. 
You can, for example, flip the access control bit from user to supervisor, if you're lucky or if you're careful. Can this happen? Well, you know the answer, basically. It can happen in Rovehammer. I'm going to give you an example of how it happens, but I will, I'm going to remi remind you what Rovehammer is also very quickly because we have studied it. Maybe you didn't appreciate what that is at the beginning of the class, but maybe you will appreciate it right now because now you know actually how virtual memory protects memory pages and how you can circumvent that memory protection. I'm, I'm going to actually show you how Google did it in their first attack uh, in 2015 based on our work. Okay, we know that you can predictably induce uh, bit flips in DRAM chips, and this leads to a system security vulnerability. The question is, why does it lead to a system security vulnerability? Let's remember what this is. Basically, if you keep uh, activating and precharging, meaning applying high voltage and low voltage, high voltage and low voltage to a single row in DRAM, you can get bit flips in adjacent rows. That's the idea. Clearly, this is not supposed to happen because you're changing these victim rows, and the victim rows may belong to different processes different page table entries. Now it may make sense. And we're going to see how you can actually flip bits in important page table entries so that you can get, gain access to the entire system. OK, so you can actually do this hammering in a real program that looks like this. A real program, actually, which is interesting. Now you know probably a lot of this. Maybe you don't know what cache line flushes, but this basically flushes the cache line from the caches. So what this program does is it selects address x and y such that they map to the same bank. It avoids cache hits because you need to avoid caches so that you can access memory and uh, flip the bits in memory. You need to avoid the row hits. You need to avoid the row buffer as well. And you know all of these structures by now. You need to avoid all kinds of caching in the system so that you access rows X and Y in the system. And this simple program does it actually. You need to select the address X and Y carefully, of course. OK? Actually, you can eliminate the fence. Ignore what that is for now. But uh, Google, in their uh, program, eliminated it later on. This is our original program from 2014. Okay. And we showed that you can actually do this in real systems and you can get a lot of bit flips. Now, we said that you can take over an otherwise secure system. Somebody can hijack your computer by taking advantage of those bit flips. And Google folks actually showed that, if you remember, in an earlier lecture, uh, we discussed it. And I actually showed you the slide where I copied and pasted from Google's blog post, uh, where they basically said they replicated the problem based on the information provided uh, in our, our paper, in ISCA 2014 paper over here. And they built two kinds of attacks. One of them was very interesting, as I said. Uh, as an unprivileged user level process, you basically can escalate privilege. You can gain kernel privileges on x86-64 Linux. And they basically, as I said, if you don't, maybe you don't uh, appreciate it at the time, but right now you can appreciate it. On a machine vulnerable to the row hammer problem, the user level process induces bit flips in page table entries, and it can gain write access to its own page table. And once you gain write access to your own page table, what can you do? You can set your permission bits, right? Because you know the page table structure, it's public. And then gain read write access to all the physical memory. So let's take a look at how this happens in a little bit more detail because I think this is fun. And this also shows you how systems engineering and security engineering is uh, very interesting. And Google folks actually were quite creative in creating this attack. And a lot of later attacks uh, were based on this type of attack, uh, later Rohammer type of attacks, let's say, bit flip type of attacks. So I'm going to use the slides that uh, Mark Seaborn presented in his Black at 2015 talks, a fraction of the slides. And basically, this is the description of the exploit they have. So uh, as you know now, also x86 page table entries are dense and trusted. They control access to physical memory. A bit flip in a page table's physical page number can give a process access to a different physical page. Now you can appreciate that, right? If you change the uh, physical page number with a bit flip, you can gain access to a completely different page. So the aim of the exploit they developed was to get access to a page table. And once they get write access to a page table, this gives access to all of the physical memory. They, when they say get access, they mean write access in the end. They should be able to write to the page table. But of course, it's not easy. They need to cleverly construct the attack. And they wanted to maximize the chances that a bit flip is useful. So what they developed was a technique called page table spraying. They spray physical memory with many, 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 many page tables so that they can increase the probability of the attack. And they basically try to check for useful repeatable bit flip first. So basically, first they try to template the memory, figure out which parts of the memory they can bit flip reliably. And then they spray the memory with page tables. And then they basically try to land a page table to a location that they know is able to, uh, that they know uh, they're able to flip. And that's the idea. So, and uh, they, this is a copy from their slides. They show a very similar page table entry as I showed you, except this is the long mode. It's the 
it's a uh, it's a it's a it's basically a 64 bit entry PTE. X86 has many different types of page tables, if you will, because they had support backward compatibility with 32 bit, 16 bit, 8 bit address spaces, etc. But basically, uh, this is what they say: the page table is a 4K page containing an array of 512 PTEs. Each PTE is 64 bits, as we have discussed, right? And there is a physical base page base address. So they said they could flip writable permission bit, read write over here, as we have discussed. This is only one bit. One bit out of 64 gives you a 2% chance. Not so good. But they decided they should flip physical page numbers. It's 20 bits on a four gigabyte system. And you get a 31% chance of flipping bits over here. This is 20 out of 64 is 31%, right? OK, so let's take a look at how they do the attack. So this is the virtual address space. This is physical memory. And then they say, what happens when we map a file with read write permissions? So a file gets mapped over here. As some, uh, one of you asked the question, what happens when you do a file IO? Part of the file that you're accessing, four kilobyte portion, gets mapped to physical memory. What else happens? Well, page tables also get mapped to physical memory. And page table basically provide you read write permissions and in direction to that file. OK, now we're going to be clever. What's next? What happens when you repeatedly map the same file with read write permissions? In the virtual address space, you basically keep different virtual addresses, but they map to the same physical address. But page table entries are different for different virtual addresses. Now we're creating many, many page table entries that map the different virtual pages to the same physical page, because it's the same file in the end. You're just opening it again and again and again and again and again, 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 so that you're getting a different virtual address. OK, this sounds beautiful. What you can do is you can fill the entire physical memory with page table entries, or a good chunk of it. And now you have a lot of page table entries over here, and just little data. And each of them points to the pages in the same physical file mapping, and you have read write access. Remember that write access is important over here. Now, if a bit's in the right place in the page table entry flips due to Rohammer, the corresponding virtual address now points to a wrong physical page with read write access. And that happens to house a page table. Chances are this wrong page contains a page table itself, an attacker that can read write page tables now. And they can use that to map any memory read or write, meaning they can change the page table and they can write to any part of memory. Right? Because you have access to a single page table. It doesn't matter what page table it is. You have access to that page table. You can map it to anywhere in memory, which means that you can you can read or write any content in memory at this point, which means that your system is completely compromised. That's the idea, basically. And this is their exploit strategy, as I, I, I've given you that, actually. Now you, you understand how virtual memory works. You understand how bit flips work. As a result, you know how this works, probably. Right? Of course, it's security engineering. In practice, there are many complications, as you can see at the bottom. But you allocate a large chunk of physical mem memory, uh, not physical uh, memory in general, search for locations prone to flipping first, Check if they fall into the right spot in a PTE for allowing the exploit, because they need to be, you need to be able to flip the right bits in the PTE. So you need to template the memory to figure out what parts of uh, your memory are actually vulnerable to this sort of bit flips. And they should really be in the right locations corresponding to, let's go back, corresponding to this physical page base address, basically. But you can do all of that. That's not hard. If you know your system at the low level nicely, it's not hard. And then return that particular area of memory to the operating system. Saying of, so basically, user does this. User uh, allocates the memory, checks the memory, figures out whether it's vulnerable to row hammer, and then finds a good part of memory and returns back to the operating system. The operating system doesn't know that the user figured out that a part of memory is vulnerable to memory. And then the user is going to be clever. It's going to force the OS to reuse the memory of the page table entries by allocating massive quantities of address space, just like we discussed, by page table spraying. And then it causes the bit flip. It shifts the PT to point into the page table. And now you can get read write access to all of your physical memory and you can abuse it as you want. Of course, it's not easy. There are many complications. And if you're really interested, you can watch their talk and read their blog. And that's why Rohammer is successful, basically, because it's relatively easy to exploit. It's much easier than Meltdown and Spectre, actually. It's re re relatively easy to exploit. OK, I'm not going to go through this in detail. I showed you some of these slides, but there are many, many works that have done similar exploits. And they basically fundamentally do something similar. Uh, I'm not going to go through this. Some of them actually leak bits. So you're, you, some of them allow you to infer bits in some virtual memory location that you're not supposed to have access to. 
And these are the more uh, neural network kind of works uh, that basically deplete the intelligence of the neural networks, if you will. OK, so we've discussed Rohammer. If you're interested, you can certainly read more about it. And I think this is fascinating, as you can see. And we have some recent work showing that Rohammer problem still exists. Unfortunately, we, have, we need to fix it. And we have some solutions. If you're interested, you can also read them. But I will point out that very recently, this was actually a few days ago, Google uh, provided another blog post and a PDF file also, where they said that they have a new hammering technique for Rohammer that shows that Rohammer is getting worse in addition to the papers that we have written that I showed you flashed earlier. They basically show over here that uh, you can have victim far away from the aggressor. These are physical distances. You can have a victim uh, over here, a heavy aggressor over here, and a lightweight aggressor. And by orchestrating the accesses to this aggressor, may, doing many accesses over here, and a small number of accesses over here, you can actually cause bit flips in the victims over here that are farther away. And they basically say that this is likely an indication that the electrical coupling responsible for Rohammer is effectively becoming stronger in newer technologies, just like the conclusion of our work. But they, they show another, another example of how Rohammer is getting worse in real systems. OK, so I find this fascinating. So I will keep recommending you the Rohammer lecture. And you can find more detailed lectures on Rohammer in our computer architecture class. So takeaway, basically, if hardware is unreliable, higher level security and protection mechanisms are useless to say uh, it's directly, let's say. They may be compromised, basically. So virtual memory uh, provides protection at a higher level. It's great. But if you have hardware faults, uh, faults, you have a problem. This means that the root of security and trust is that is really at the very, very low levels, at the hardware level, in the hardware itself. So Rohammer, Spectre, Meltdown are recent key examples of this. So what should we assume the hardware provides? How do we keep the hardware reliable? How do we design secure hardware? How do we design secure hardware with high performance, high energy efficiency, low cost, and convenient programming? These are all excellent questions. And we really need to think about this uh, deeply because uh, as Rohammer shows and as Spectre and Meltdown reinforce, the real root of security has to be at the hardware. If you have some problem at the hardware level, all of the security mechanisms, protection mechanisms like virtual memory, like we've been talking about, can be compromised significantly. So there's plenty of exciting and highly relevant research questions over here. And if you're interested, certainly you can uh, go further. In the epilogue part of this lecture, uh, I will tell you more about some future directions. OK, I think this is a good place to take a relatively short break. I'm, uh, let's, I, uh, this time, sorry, I'm going to give you an eight minute break. Uh, because I want to really finish virtual memory and give you some idea of epilogue. Uh, but we're almost done with virtual memory. We're going to cover some issues in a little bit less detail. Uh, well, some interesting issues and open up some questions. And then we're going to conclude with a real system example. And then we're going to do an epilogue. But let's take an eight minute break right now. Uh, and we will be back at, I guess, 1526. Okay, I think we can uh, continue. I'm going to delete this lecture break slide. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about issues in virtual memory, but some of which we've already talked about. So these are some extra slides for your benefit. Uh, I'm going to go through some of them quickly. But we already discussed how large is the page table and how do we store and access it. I'm going to give you a little bit more example from real systems with some additional slides, uh, but we're going to skip some of the slides. The second question is, how can we speed up translation and access control check? Again, we've discussed this, TLBs. But again, these are very important. That's why I raise up these questions. And then there's a third question, which was brought up uh, by one of you in the last lecture, I think. When do we do the translation in relation to the cache access? And that's going to be important. I'm going to give you a teaser of that, but we're not going to go into the details. There are some backup slides and some lecture references you can take a look at. There are many other issues in virtual memory that we will not cover in detail. I mentioned some of those actually while we were uh, discussing some earlier issues. What happens on a context switch? How can you handle multiple page sizes in an efficient manner, et cetera? Uh, we're going to touch upon some of this when I give you a real world example, but not in great detail. So issue one is how large is the page table? Where do we store it in hardware, physical memory, virtual memory? I think we've already discussed these questions with multi-level page tables, part of the page tables in physical memory, and the rest is in virtual memory, and some of it is not allocated also. And how can we store it efficiently without requiring physical memory that can store all page tables? And the idea is multi-level page tables, as we have discussed, right? And this is the slide uh, that I'm showing you for the fourth time, perhaps, uh, because we have seen it in the last lecture also. And we already discussed the solution. And uh, we discussed how to do the page table access. There actually, there's a page table base register. There's also a page table limit register so that you don't exceed the virtual memory that you're accessing 
if virtual page number is out of bounds, it exceeds the page table limit register, then the process did not allocate the virtual page. So there's an access control exception that happens based on that as well. So there's hardware checks. X86 actually has segmentation also, as we discussed in the last lecture, which is a different level of protection, but it's not, it's not as important today. Uh, that's why we don't talk about it as much. Uh, okay, we already discussed that page table based register is a part of process context. It's an architectural register and it needs to be loaded when the process context switched in. If you don't do that, then you have a problem basically. And it's the hardware's job to do that. If you don't do that, actually, the process you will be using somebody else's page table based register and you basically compromise security and privacy right away, right? So the hardware bugs uh, at any level of this process can uh, directly affect your security and privacy basically. Okay, I've already given you these examples. I'm actually going to skip to the page table entries that are more, so these are more recent, this is x 64 You can see that page table entries have increased to 64 bits. So they used to be 32 bits over here. These are, each of these are page table entries. And you can see that now they're 64 bits. Why? Because we need to be able to address larger and larger virtual and physical memories. Uh, and so you can see that there are different types of page table entries, CR3. It, there's, there's possibility of five level paging in x86-64. So this is a fifth level, which, which is the, they don't call it the directory anymore. Of course, this is the first level. If you have fifth level, this is the first level if you have four levels. And you can see that there are one gigabyte page frames also. So there are three, uh, types of pages in x86 right now, one gigabyte, two megabytes, and four kilobytes. And you need to choose which page you want. This is a tough choice, not an easy choice, or the system needs to choose for you what type of page they, uh, they want. And again, it's not it's a tough choice, basically. It depends on your locality characteristics and your translation, right? And you can see that uh, the other flags also exist. There's nothing special that I want to provide over here other than this is the four level paging example that I showed you earlier, right? We're not going to go through this again, but existing systems are complicated multi-level uh, page tables. This is four level paging for four kilobyte pages, I should say. This is four level paging for two megabyte pages. So it's, uh, and this is uh, four level paging for one megabyte, one gigabyte page. So clearly for one gigabyte page, you do actually don't have four levels, right? You have two levels over here and you have three levels for two megabyte pages, but this is the four level paging is the four, the name of the, paging mechanism that they use. That's why it's called all four level paging. The maximum level is four with the smallest page size. Okay, so that's how large is the page table and how complicated it gets basically. So how can we speed up the address translation and check? We already know about translation look aside buffers. Uh, we've already talked about how to make it fast. Let's talk about uh, who manages it. Meaning what if you miss in the TLD? So TLD caches the recent access translations, the recent translations, but what if you miss in the TLD? What TLB entry do you replace? Clearly, this is a caching decision. Who tells the TLB miss? Hardware versus software. And there are advantages and disadvantages to this. In many systems today, hardware is increasingly handling the TLB misses. But uh, there, there are actually some systems that handle the uh, page uh, TLB misses in software, like MIPS actually handles TLB misses in software. And that gives more flexibility to the system. And we're going to talk about the trade-offs. And then what should be done on a page fault is what if you actually find out the PTE eventually and figure out that it's a page fault? Then what virtual page do you replace from versus physical memory? These are different events. I want to emphasize that TLB miss is very different from page fault. TLB misses is that uh, says that the translation is not cached in the TLB, in the hardware TLB. Page fault means that the physical page corresponding to this virtual page is not mapped in physical memory. It doesn't exist in physical memory. So you need to bring it. You may get a TLB miss that doesn't result in a page fault obviously, right? You can actually have a valid page table entry. You may get a, a page fault that doesn't result in a TLB miss. That also happens if, if the page table entry is cached in the TLB, but it becomes invalid for some reason. And there are reasons for it, for TLB coherence reasons, for example, uh, when you, for example, uh, replace, uh, 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 replace, uh, replace the uh, page uh, that is subject to the translation, you may actually invalidate that TLB entry. Uh, it depends on how we invalidate exactly the TLB entry, of course, but this is certainly possible also depending on how we implement things, but it's more rare, of course. So who handles the page fault? It's usually the software, basically. Hardware can potentially accelerate it, but so actually I should say it's cooperative, but it's done under the supervision of the software, basically. You, you usually have an exception that leads you to a software handler and the software handler decides what to replace and how to handle the page fault. Usually hardware handles the TLB, but not always. 
Okay, we already discussed the TLB. This is a more generic explanation, so you can take a look at it. But basically, the TLB is small. It cannot hold, hold all PT. Some translation requests will inevitably miss in the TLB. So you must access memory to find the required PT. This is called walking the page table. Essentially, you walk all levels of the page table in a multi-level page table to get to the PTE, page table entry you're looking for. And this takes a long time, as you know, right? There's a large performance penalty. So better TLB management and prefetching can reduce TLB misses, just like better cache management and prefetching. But then eventually you get a TLB miss. Who handles that TLB miss? Is it the job of the hardware or software? Meaning whenever you get a TLB miss, do you take an exception or does the hardware handle it? So there are multiple approaches. It's hardware managed in most systems today, x86, ARM, et cetera, for example. And hardware does a page fault. Essentially it walks through all of the page table, uh, page table accesses. And it fetches the PTE in the end and inserts it into the TLB. If the TLB is full, the entry uh, replaces another entry. It's basically you do the replacement. And it's done transparently to the system software. This way you can employ specialized structures and caches, for example, page walkers and page walk caches that we will see in an example soon. Approach two is software managed. MIPS actually, the architecture that you are implementing does it, except you're not implementing the virtual memory part. The hardware raises an exception and the operating system does the page walk using some instructions. You can clearly do that, right? You can clearly construct instructions to access page tables. And the operating system fetches the PTE and the operating system inserts and evicts entries in the TLB. Essentially, this is a software managed TLB. And clearly there are trade-offs to this approaches. And you can imagine some of the trade-offs. Hardware managed TLBs, there is no exception that TLB miss instruction just stalls. Other instructions may already be going on in an out of order machine. That's great. Independent instructions may continue. And there are no extra instructions data brought into caches. You don't do a context switch to a software. So that's the big advantage. And that's why hardware managed TLBs are commonly used today. But then the downside is page directory and table organizations etched into the system. The hardware needs to uh, implement that. And if you change it somehow in software, your hardware that manages the TLB is useless now. So OS has little flexibility in deciding uh, the TLB organization and page, page table and directory organization. Software managed TLB, of course, doesn't have that disadvantage. The OS can define the page table organization independently of the hardware. And it can also employ more sophisticated TLB replacement policies. The downside is performance overhead. You need to generate an exception and you need to flush the pipeline, ex uh, execute the exception handler, and extra instructions are brought into the cache. Of course, you could handle this in another thread. Uh, so you may actually eliminate some of the performance overhead like the pipeline flush, but still there's overhead in executing other instructions uh, to actually uh, handle the software managed TLB. In hardware, if you handle it, you can have a specialized structure completely as we will see in Intel systems soon. Okay, the final issue that I'm going to briefly touch on is when do we do the address translation in relation to cache access? And this becomes important, especially from the perspective of the L1 cache. Uh, because at the, uh, if, if, L1, if you need to do the translation to access the cache, now translation is on your critical path, right? Critical path of cache access. So this is a teaser. When do we do the address transition? Do you do it before or after accessing the L1 cache? And in other words, is the cache virtually addressed or physically addressed? And this is a fundamental choice at the L1 level, but you could also potentially move it to the L2, L3 levels, but it doesn't make sense fully at, the, at some point. Uh, and then uh, the, the, the difficult question is, what are the issues with a virtually addressed cache? And there are issues. And one issue is synonym problem. Basically two different virtual addresses from, uh, the same process or different processes can map to the same physical address, which means that same physical address can be present in multiple locations in the cache if you're actually using virtual addresses to ad address the cache. And this can lead to inconsistency in data because the same physical address in different multiple locations, let's say different sets, different indices in the cache. And if one of them is updated, the other one needs to be updated also or invalidated. So you have a coherence or consistency problem inside your own cache if your cache is virtual, because two different virtual addresses can map to the same physical address. There are other problems, actually. This is one problem. There's also a homonym problem, which is the fact that same virtual address can map to two different physical addresses. Why does this happen? Because virtual address can be in different processes, right? The same, the different processes have the same, uh, have, have, have the virtual address space to each, each of them. And the same virtual address can be mapped to different physical addresses. And this becomes a problem when you're managing the cache uh, if, if, if it's completely virtual. So usually the solution to fix the homonym problem is to introduce address space IDs 
to distinguish between different processes and address spaces. This is easier to solve at hardware cost. Synonym problem is different virtual address can map to the same physical address. And again, why? Different pages can share the same physical frame within or across processes, right? Essentially, different virtual addresses can map to the same physical address. Just like we saw in the Google example, right? Different virtual addresses map to the same file, which is mapped to the physical memory. And many different virtual addresses can map to the same physical address. And there could be many reasons. Shared libraries, shared data, copy on write pages within the same process, files that are mapped. That's part of shared data, actually. And then uh, the question is, do homonyms and synonyms create problems when we have a cache? And is the cache virtually or physically addressed uh, becomes a very relevant question over here. And there are ways of solving the synonym problems also. I'm not going to go into detail. I have some backup slides for this, but I would like you to think about it if you're interested in this. So there are three ways of designing uh, the first level cache. It could be physical, meaning it can uh, the access of the cache happens after the virtual to physical address translation. You don't have the homonym and synonym problems, but you have a huge latency overhead. You need to access the cache, you need to go through TLB. And we discussed that first level cache is very latency sensitive. So you don't want to do that. In general, it's not done. The second option is you access the cache completely with virtual address and then do the translation. This is completely virtual. So there's too much flexibility and there's too many homonym and synonym problems because of this. As a result, this is also not done in general. Usually you do a compromise that looks like this, a virtual physical cache or virtually indexed physically tagged cache where you access the cache concurrently with the TLB and then you do the tag check using the physical address. Now, for this to work, you need to design your cache carefully such that the indices, the virtual index, doesn't change during translation. So you should really not index the cache using part of the address that's going to change using the translation. Otherwise, you may actually map two different virtual addresses, uh, two virtual addresses to uh, two different virtual addresses that map to the same physical location to different locations in the cache. So if you didn't understand that, that's OK. But if you understood it, that's good, because that means that you've actually been uh, really following what's, what's going on in virtual memory. But think about what happens in, uh, in this case. What kind of bits should you use for the index into the cache? And what can you do and what can you not do? So the idea is virtually index the cache, but do the tag comparison in the cache using physical addresses, because you will have the physical address at the end over here. OK, and usually systems employ this sort of caches, virtually indexed physical tag cache at the first level. The problem is not present in the lower higher level of the hierarchies, because at that point, you already have the physical address. You'd better do the TLB translation before the second level, for example. OK, see backup slides for more. Let me now quickly go over a modern virtual memory system uh, in Intel Skylake, and then we're going to transition to the epilogue part. So this is. Uh, address translation has evolved a lot. So this is simple address translation, earlier systems. You have an L1 data, an L1 instruction TLB, L1 data cache, which is not part of your translation system, but usually you do it concurrently with the L1 data cache, as we discussed. And then there's a software page table worker like MIPS. Modern address translation is much more complicated. Modern MMU, you can think of this as MMU. You have L1, L2 ITLBs, L1 to ITLB, L2, L1 data TLB, L2 TLB, page table worker hardware, page table Volker cache to cache the middle levels of the page table, page tables, multi-level page table. So there's a lot that goes on. And then there's also clearly the cache. So a memory management unit, we discussed it. It's responsible. It's the hardware that's responsible for uh, resolving address translation requests. It's one MMU per core, usually. MMU has three key components, TLBs. We know what TLBs are. Page table vault caches. They essentially offer fast access to the intermediate levels of a multi-level page table. So TLBs cache PTEs, not the intermediate parts of the page, level, page tables, but page table walk caches cache intermediate mappings at the hierarchy, page table hierarchy. This is to aid the ta uh, translation TLB misses essentially. And then hardware page table walker that sequentially does the page table walk to, uh, that access the different levels of the page table to fetch the required PT. And this is all in hardware. So now we can see that there's a big hardware over here. OK, let's take a look at this MMU. Let's tear it apart in an Intel Skylake system, which is reasonably new. Uh, L1 data TLB, uh, essentially, even this is complicated. Basically, they have three TLBs, each for different page sizes, four kilobyte, two megabyte, one gigabyte. And you can see the entries over here. There's only four empty one gigabyte TLB uh, and fully associative. But this, uh, you, can, you can address four gigabytes of memory with this. That's why it's four entry. 
two megabytes, 32 entries, you can address only 64 megabytes, right? With all of those. The 64 entries, you can address only 256 kilobytes, I guess, in this case. That's too bad. So this TLB is actually quite powerful. Even though it has fewer entries, it's very powerful because it really uh, spans a four gigabyte portion of the physical memory. Okay, virtual memory, uh, I should say, but also physical memory. I mean, if you think about it from that perspective, right? And virtual to physical mappings are inserted into corresponding TLB after a TLB miss, clearly. And during a translation request, all three L1 TLBs are looked up in parallel. So now you can see that it's complicated. And having multiple page sizes clearly complicates the picture. And Intel folks did not design a single TLB with different page sizes because they thought it was easier to design three TLBs with different page sizes. And you can imagine, this is a cartoonish picture. You, can, you need to basically index these TLBs with different uh, parts of the virtual address and do the tag match, et cetera, uh, and then decide which one you hit on. OK. So there's an L2 unified instruction and data TLB. Essentially, L2 unified TLB cache translates for both instruction and data. It's still private per individual core. And there are two separate L2 TLB structures now, one for four kilobyte and two megabyte pages, and one for one gigabyte pages. And you can see that these are bigger. But again, they decided to consolidate four kilobyte and two megabyte together. So the, uh, this, this, uh, the, the design of the TLB is a little bit more complicated for this one. OK, but these are bigger, as you can see, and you can see the penalties. Of course, the question is, how can you support both four kilobyte and two megabyte pages using a single structure? There is not enough detail on this. But you can imagine, we discussed this actually when we talk about associativity in time. You basically index the TLB once using a four kilobyte index. And then if you, don't, if you miss, you index the TLB again. OK, that's the idea, basically. There are two steps, basically. Uh, to, uh, in time, you index the TLB using assuming different page sizes. OK? If you hit in the first step, that's good. Then it's a four kilobyte page. If you miss in the first step and in the second, second step, then it, it's a two megabyte page. If you miss in both, then you need to do the page table walk. The general algorithm is to recalculate the index and probe the TLB for all remaining page sizes. And we've seen this in associativity in time. If you remember the cache lectures, we said pseudo associativity. This is poor man's associative cache, if you will. We have associativity in space normally, but now we have associativity in time. We change the index and index into the cache again and again and again. I can do it many, many times to get very high levels of associativity or support any uh, number of uh, page sizes. And this is the example, basically. You first calculate the index for uh, four kilobyte. If you miss, you calculate the index for two megabytes. OK, so L2 TLB has n-step index recalculation. This is simple and practical. The downside is TLB hit latency is longer and varying. And uh, now you have slower identification of L2 TLB miss as you need to basically probe all page sizes. So potentially, you can optimize it by making the lookup parallel. Of course, this adds hardware cost. Or you can predict the page size, predict the probing order. And trade-offs are, again, similar to associativity in time versus space. OK, let's talk about the hardware page walker components. As we said, TLB misses are handled in hardware. And this is an interesting component, complicated component, uh, that walks the multi-level page table to avoid expensive context switches and software handling of TLB misses. It has two components. One is a state machine that is designed to be aware of the architecture's page table structure, and then registers that keep track of outstanding TLB misses. So I'm not going to go into the details of it, but you can imagine how the state machine walks the page table. Of course, the, 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 I, I, we actually saw the slide earlier. This avoids the need for context switch on a TLB miss. It also has the, uh, the ability to overlap TLB misses with useful computation, as we discussed. It supports concurrent TLB misses, because in hardware, you can support many concurrent misses. But of course, there's a downside hardware area and power overheads. And now the software uh, cannot change the page table uh, organization and properties, if you will. It's etched into the hardware. OK, so uh, how do you do this walk? I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you start with CR3 register and then concatenate CR3 with the virtual address. And then you essentially do the walk of the multi-level page table that we discussed earlier. So it takes time, basically. Uh, OK. But of course, there's benefit to it. That's why it's implemented in real processors. It allows overlapping of many TLB misses with useful computation. So if you do the software TLB mishandling, you need to context switch to a TLB mishandler. And then you do a load B. You cannot handle this TLB hit, hit, TLB hit because you have a context switch. Right? Hardware page table walk, TLB miss. Concurrently, you can handle other TLB hits. So you can do out of order execution. And you can get the full benefits of out of order execution, et cetera. Right? So you save a lot of cycles, actually with hardware TLB mishandling. It's also called a page table walk, basically. OK, finally, to aid this hardware page table walk, there are page walk caches 
as we discussed, is different from the TLDs because TLDs cache the page table entries, the leaf nodes in the last level page table. Page wall caches, cache stuff, going back to this picture, from essentially all of these other levels, not, not the real page table that you're looking for. Why? Basically, you want to speed up the hardware page table walk. That's the idea. I already said all of this, actually. These are low latency caches that provide faster access to the page table levels so that the page table walker does not have to access memory or the cache hierarchy for every page table walk. It can just access these page wall caches. Okay. And that's the Intel Skylake MMU for you, basically, in a nutshell, very quickly. And actually, there are other virtual memory designs. This is Apple A14 over here based on some reverse engineering, et cetera. But you can see that L1 TLB and L2 TLB are larger in Apple A14. And also the page size, the default page size is actually larger. I'm not going to go through the details of it, but you can enjoy the slide on your own. OK, so we're at the end of virtual memory. Uh, so to summarize, uh, virtual memory has a lot of benefits. It gives the illusion of infinite capacity. And uh, we already discussed everything, so I'm not going to go through all of this again. This is a summary of everything we discussed. But it provides you the illusion of infinite capacity. It also provides you protection. That's very important. And there are a lot of issues that you need to solve along the way. And those issues all exist in real systems, and they're solved in some way. But there's more, which we're not going to talk about. How do you handle virtualized systems pose a problem. I'm going to flash a slide related to this. You may have virtual machines and hypervisors running programs, orchestrating systems. Now you have another virtualization layer. And that actually increases the number of virtual memory translations that you need to do. And existing systems provide support for that, called nested page walks, for example. I'm not going to talk about that, nested TLDs. Uh, there are alternative page table structures that we did not talk about. Inverted page tables we briefly mentioned when you want to actually, the operating system may uh, uh, store the reverse mappings from physical pages to virtual pages to figure out what to replace. Some systems actually have inverted page tables to begin with, probably a bad idea, but there are trade-offs uh, associated with it because inverted page tables are actually quite compact in terms of storage size, these are small. Uh, hashed page tables, it can enable fast access to the page tables. Actually, this may be a good idea to revisit in many systems, uh, which we did not talk about. Uh, basically, we just directly indexed. We didn't really ha do sophisticated hashing uh, to the virtual address. And there's more that uh, we don't have time to cover. But I will show you the one picture over here, which is the virtualized system. You may have a virtual machine, for example, like VMware. Uh, you may have a guest OS running on a host OS, running on the physical CPU. And this virtualized environment needs to have an additional level of address translation from the guest OS virtual address to the host OS uh, virtual address. And then host OS virtual address needs to be translated to the host OS, uh, the CPU physical address, essentially. And that requires another level of layer of translation, if you will. And this leads to a lot more memory accesses, basically. I'm not going to go over it, but it's a lot of memory accesses. And existing hardware, x86 hardware for sure, uh, provides uh, support for uh, directly translating from the guest virtual address to the host physical address while trying to avoid as much as possible this indirection level. So that's a direct support for virtualized systems. OK, so let me conclude with this parting thoughts, uh, the virtual memory part. And then we're going to have an epilogue uh, for those who wish to stay uh, in the rest of the lecture. But virtual memory is actually very important because it's one of the most successful examples of multiple things. Architectural support for programmers, how to partition work between hardware and software. So it's really hardware software cooperation, which is similar to what I said over here. And it's a very successful example of the programmer architect trade-off. It basically makes programmers' life super easy, architects' life, both system architect and microarchitects' life harder, as we have seen. But it is one of the most successful examples. But going forward, how does it scale into the future? It's not doing very well, in my opinion. And there are a lot of papers that are written on it. I'm going to show you some pictures of it also. But basically, we have increasing huge physical memory sizes, both local and remote. And 256 terabytes are starting to sound small for our memory sizes, basically because data is huge. We have hybrid physical memory systems, DRAM, NVM, SSDs, and we want, we want to increasingly manage everything using a single uh, memory abstraction. There are many accelerators in the system addressing physical memory. They want to be part of the virtual memory. And there are virtualized systems, like I showed you earlier, hard hypervisor, software virtualization, local and remote memories. So how does it scale into the future? So the management is actually quite complex uh, overall. So it's not going to scale uh, very well. 
so there's one question. In case of hashing, will the synonym and homonym problems be reduced? Uh, not necessarily. That's a very good question, but not necessarily. Basically, uh, you still have a virtual address and you still have a physical address. It's just a way of determining the mapping. OK, uh, so if you want to know more about rethinking virtual memory, we do uh, a lot of that in my research group, actually. And this is one of the papers that we have written uh, last year uh, uh, that rethinks virtual memory uh, from different perspectives. You can also watch a lecture related to it. This tries to solve the rigid page table structure problems, translation overheads, which we have discussed many times, and heterogeneous memory management. But if you're interested, we're not going to cover it. We can, you can take the uh, future lectures or also read the paper. And there's a lot more in virtual memory. Like if you want to know more about the synonym and homonym problems, we cover that uh, in other lectures, but we don't have time to cover it in this lecture. But you can also watch lectures. As you can see, there are multiple solutions to the problem. OK, there are more lectures on virtual memory that I'm not going to uh, go over right now. But hopefully, this gave you a reasonably comprehensive overview of issues in virtual memory, which I think is critical to get exposed to as early as possible in your career, because it is a lot of cool ideas. It is a lot of complexity at the end. But it's one of those things that has been successful despite the complexity, heavy complexity, because it makes programmers' life easier.